So I've been thinking a lot about what is the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence, human consciousness. And there have even been cases uh, in AI where uh, Blake Lemoyne of Google was fired for saying that AI, their large language mile, uh, model, ha had generated consciousness. And um, I wanted to, um, you know, talk about that idea and, and kind of give us some ways to think about what is the role of the human uh, versus the machine. Um, and I want to start this story in a kind of unusual place. Uh, I went to Princeton and I went to reunions this past May and every reunion for the last 45 years, Princeton has hosted a Dante reunion. Uh, it was started by Robert Hollander, and then after he died, uh, the Princeton Italian professor Simone Marchesi uh, leads it. That's actually a picture that I took, uh, and a bunch of uh, old gray hairs like me uh, come into a wood paneled seminar room and talk about Dante for a couple hours uh, during our college reunion when everybody's outside uh, drinking and partying. And so uh, this is obviously a super nerdy activity. I adore it. I love it. Uh, in this case, we were talking about um, Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, book three, which is Paradiso. And, and there you can see uh, Simone Marchese. He was like a conductor conducting the conversation, kind of pulling insights out of people, you know, moving the conversation around with his hands. It was, it was really quite beautiful to watch. And as I'm going through uh, the session, I start to ask myself, you know, what would Dante have to say about a large language model? What would Dante have to say about artificial intelligence and human consciousness? Because he was a linguist and he was constantly talking about these issues in his text, not about artificial intelligence, but about the nature of human intelligence and consciousness and the soul. I mean, after all, it was really uh, about the descent of the soul down to the depths of hell and then up to the heights of heaven. So I asked Simone Marchese afterwards, how would he define human consciousness um, in the age of AI? And he, his response you know, was characteristically brilliant. He said, human consciousness lies in the decision not to act. Human consciousness lies in the decision not to act. And so uh, this was actually an idea that he had first thought of uh, almost a decade ago uh, at a brain language and philosophy conference on decision making in, co in partnership with the Neuroscience Institute. And he gave an entire paper back in 2014 about this idea that not acting is what marks human consciousness. And the more I, I thought about this idea, the more profound and right it seemed to me. The act of a human being is the intake of breath, is the pause before deciding, is the beat you take before you say something. It's the decision that you make about whether to act and what to do before you act. If you look at ChatGPT, one of its most remarkable features is how quickly it moves, is the speed with which it responds. There is no pause. There is no beat. It immediately starts processing and responding. That is a robot. That is non-human. That is AI. And what I found so profound in this is it's actually in that, that beat that you take before you respond, where you consider the options and then choose the best one is really where I think the human being in the machine lies. Uh, I remember I was getting sales coaching recently and uh, he was telling me that I was moving too fast, that I was often kind of racing ahead uh, of my sales prospect. I was thinking too fast, my brain moved too fast and that I needed to learn the discipline uh, of pausing and of taking a beat. I remember when I was teaching interviewing, I said, the most powerful question is silence because people feel compelled to fill that vacuum. So this idea 
of not acting has really um, struck me. And I realized, you know, when I studied narrative theory, there was this great Joseph Campbell, and it was called The Hero's Journey or The Monomyth. And he mapped out the stages of the hero's journey that were universal across all cultures. And there are 12 different stages. And I realized that one of the most important and often overlooked stages was stage three, the refusal of the call. So you have a hero, he, he or she is living in the ordinary world, and then they get a call to adventure. You know, Luke Skywalker is orphaned and living with his aunt and uncle, and then he's called to adventure to take on the Republic. And then I don't know if you remember, but he said, you know, I can't do it. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. I, you know, I, I like my life the way it is. That's the refusal of the call. That's the moment of human consciousness where the hero ignores the call to adventure. They express their reluctance to follow the steps of their quote, destiny. They reveal their insecurities, fears, and conflicts, inner and external. And they debate other possibilities. And that moment, that intake of breath, that pause, that refusal of the call, that's where the other possibilities happen. Do I press the nuclear button or no? AI presses the button. They have an objective that achieves the objective. The human being says, is there another way? And then, you know, in the hero's journey, that's a stage in the journey. And then they go on and they uh, either uh, are uh, propelled into uh, the new world, the special world, or they're forced into it. In the case of Luke Skywalker, uh, his um, family is killed. He has no choice uh, but to go forward. You, you know, the um, one of the analogies that we say is, you know, it's like cutting the ropes uh, that uh, hold the boat ashore. That cutting the ropes moment is the moment to act in the beginning of this of the journey. There is no turning back, but that walking through the threshold, that that decision to cut the ropes, that is profoundly human. And uh, you may recall that in on May 30th, the Center for AI Safety wrote that mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. And I wanted to talk about this because really what's happening in this very scary and concise statement about the risks of AI is that they're comparing the downside of AI to pandemic uh, or nuclear war. And I wanted to talk about this. Um, you know, we are in the battle over metaphors right now. What is AI? Um, and one of the best metaphors, I think, better than even the pandemic metaphor, is the nuclear power, nuclear war metaphor. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, you even see a similar shape in the mushroom cloud uh, and the nuclear power smokestack. Um, the steam coming off as a byproduct of creating nuclear power. If we had embraced the possibilities of nuclear power, we would have a much better world, one that would be carbon free with uh, almost infinite sources of sustainable energy. But we uh, were unable to embrace that opportunity in large part because of the risk of nuclear war. And so we essentially curtailed one of the most promising forms of energy in exchange for protecting ourselves against the possibility of nuclear annihilation. And I think this is a really good metaphor. We're right now in this sort of unregulated Wild West early days of AI. But I can promise you, already in Europe and soon in the United States, legislation and guardrails are coming. And I've become an advocate uh, in Congress and, and with my local legislators to advocate for the nuclear power version of AI, the, the, the incredibly powerful tool, particularly for SMBs, for small businesses that AI represents. These tools uh, are profoundly uh, epoch shaping and, and, and world changing. And as we saw, you can save thousands, tens of thousands of dollars with just a little bit of knowledge it, leveraging these tools. And we don't want to over legislate. We want to protect against the downsides, make sure the bad actors uh, don't cause a holo AI holocaust, uh, don't let these AI robots run amok. But at the same time, we really want to continue developing and building these tools. 
um, that are can be so powerful and positive for humanity and for our businesses. And so that's why I don't I don't really see much of an upside to a pandemic. There's no like upside to a pandemic. There is a upside to the a nuclear f uh, fission. Uh, and it can also destroy the world. And so I know a lot of the folks who uh, ended up creating uh, the, the theory behind atomic fission uh, ended up regretting their work. Uh, and the reason why was because it could be used for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think similarly, a lot of the AI researchers like Jeffrey Hinton and Go formerly of Google are feeling a similar feeling of regret. Uh, for this tool that they've built that could be so damaging. And so I really think the analogy is quite strong and that's the one that I use. And so, you know, my invitation to you is to ask, what is your metaphor for AI? And I would invite you to think about this and look for inspiration about this. And um, I wanted to actually talk about a book that I read. Uh, I'm a lover of tennis. Uh, it's called The Inner Game of Tennis by Timothy Galway. It's one of the classic books uh, of tennis. A and in it, he talks about self one versus self two. Self one is your conscious mind, uh, the one that you use to think, the one that causes self-talk, the one where you're like, hey, you know, you know, hit it harder, come on. Uh, you know, Rafael Nadal's famous vamos. Vamos is self one. Self two is your body, it's your subconscious. Uh, it's the non-thinking, it's when you're in flow and just letting things happen. And um, you know, in many ways, self one is the director and self two is the doer. And it occurs to me that self two is kind of like AI and, and self one is kind of like the human intelligence. In the book, The Inner Game of Tennis, Timothy Galway is recommending we try to quiet self one to allow self to, to perform. So uh, I don't know if the analogy is perfect, but it is interesting. And so as I was reading this book recently with AI in my mind, I found some really interesting insights uh, in terms of what is AI and how does it interact with humans and, and how to best make that partnership work. You know, it's interesting. I was looking for a, a quote uh, from Dante about this topic and there's this wonderful quote he said, the secret of getting things done is to act. And so while Dante um, and Simone Marchese professor, uh, who is an expert on Dante, taught us that human consciousness lies in the not acting, the secret Dante says to getting things done is to act. So what I think Dante is saying from the grave uh, five centuries ago is, if you wanna get things done, use AI, but pause, take a beat, take an intake of breath uh, before you decide exactly what it's gonna do for you.